Come here. I wasn't planning on singing today. That was not what I thought until 2 o'clock this morning. And I was awake, partly because Greg got home at 1.15 and I couldn't go back to sleep. But at 2 o'clock, I was laying there and I was like, okay, go to sleep because you got to get up. And I thought, well, I haven't read through the scripture the pastor is doing this morning. So I grabbed my phone and I went and I looked it up and the perfect song for this is a song that I have planned to sing that I didn't plan to sing. But God said, it's time. So listen to the words, don't listen to me, listen to the message in the song. Sitting at the well, just wishing I could change this life I live After years of giving love away There's nothing left to give Just a small town girl with big ideas Of what real love should be I guess those dreams are never coming true for me A penny for your thoughts the voice it seemed to come from down inside then i felt those piercing eyes i wanted to run away and hide but then he daughter have no fear what you've thirsted for so long it's finally got your New Testament, join me in John chapter 4. John 
chapter 4. While you're finding that, I just have to say, I just have to say it. How about them dogs? <laughs> and then them yellow jackets did okay too. They, knocked off. they beat the tar out of them, didn't they? Casey's done good this week. They could go, they're second in their category. Wonderful. You've got to be proud of him. Well, the Bible says weep with those that weep and mourn with those that mourn. So if your team lost, we, 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 we can console you, but uh, we congratulate the winners. Well, by now you found John 4, verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had had heard that Jesus, how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea, departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. And he cometh to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to a parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away to the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus said, or answered and said unto her, If thou knew the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto me, thee, give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. Heavenly Father, we pray for help as we always do because we need it. We need help to understand. We need help to reason. We need help to grasp. We need help to receive. We need help to preach. We need help to listen. We, we just need help. Help us today, Lord, we pray to receive with meekness the engrafted word that's able to save our soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The statement that Jesus loves you is one of the most simplest statements that could ever be made. And yet it's one of the most profound statements as well. You can tell a little child that Jesus loves them and they look up at you with them big eyes and just receive it and drink it in and with a childlike faith embrace it. God loves them. And yet some adults can sit around a table and discuss it for years and break down pronouns and verbs and get lost in, in a lot of verbiage and get, make it so complicated. And it is so simple. God loves you. That is the gospel truth. He loves you. He loves you all more than the preacher could ever say. That is an absolute truth. It will never change. Times change, but God's love doesn't. It's endless. He loves you so much, He sent His only begotten Son into the world, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You learned that a long time ago, didn't you? Yeah. He has never quit watching you. You are always on his mind. Isaiah the prophet said in chapter 49, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. John 15, Jesus said, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Think about that. As the Father loves the Son, so the Son loves you. Jeremiah said, Yea, I've loved thee with an everlasting love. Our text today makes this uh, a little easier to understand. 
John 4, 1, because the Pharisees were trying to stir the pot and cause trouble and dissension between John the Baptist and Jesus. And it starts over in chapter 3, verse 25. And they're talking about, they're just trying to stir something up. Jesus leaves the area. He leaves where he's at and he heads north to Galilee. Jesus has three options. From where he's at, he could go west and go up the Mediterranean coast and then break over into the Galilee region. Or he could go east, cross over the Jordan River and through an area that we call refer to as Perea and go up through there and then cross back over the Jordan River and be up in the Galilee, Galilee region. Or he could just simply go due north through Samaria. If you Googled that, that would tell you the best. That's the quickest, best route there is. That is the shortest route. And, you know, if you Google something, it, it, if you save two minutes, it's going to take you that way. Uh, it doesn't matter what the road's like. But if you can save two minutes, Google Maps will, will route you that way. So a guy had stopped at a little village and asked, what was the quickest way to the lake? And the uh, local there said, well, are you driving or are you walking? The guy said, well, I'm driving. And, uh, and the old guy said, well, that is the fastest way. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jesus is looking at this, and he's, he's got a plan. He's going to take the short road. Now, the Jews do it different. Because they have an opinion about the Samaritans. They were a half-breed, mixed breed. Uh, and they, they just had this long-standing feud with the Samaritans. They didn't go through that territory. They went around them. We don't associate with them. We don't do business with them. Our kids don't play with their kids. And we want nothing to do with them. And that had went back way, way back clear back to 722 B.C. when the northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians and they began now to intermarry with them and uh, worship in a different way. They just said they are unclean. We're not going to do anything with them. We don't want nothing to do with them. They are not a part of us. They are not true Jews. They're not blue bloods like us. And so they just didn't, they went around Samaria. Jesus didn't play that game. Aren't you glad for that? Jesus said in, ver, in Scripture here in verse 4 says, He must needs, He must needs go through Samaria. Meaning, if you got the NIV, it says, He had to go. He had an appointment. It was necessary that He went through Samaria. Father, we pray for the squad and, and uh, the people driving and the people that are going to take care of Father. I don't know where it's at. I don't know where they're going. They do. But in the name of Jesus, we pray for people that are uh, having a bad day. God, help them. Help those who are going to help. Save life. Be with families as they get phone calls today. Be with them all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus' disciples journey straight north through Samaria, and they come to a little village called Sychar. It's about lunchtime. Uh, it says six hours. That's that in their time. It's lunchtime. Jesus sends the disciples to go buy groceries, and they all leave to go get groceries, and he's there by himself. He's tired. He's give out from the long journey. Why it takes 12 men to go buy groceries, I don't know. It's a guy thing, but uh, they all leave him, and he's, he might be saying, man, I'm going to get some peace and quiet. <laughs> it's not going to last long. The lady's going to come there uh, with her vessel to draw water from a well. It's a God moment. It's always a God moment when you're going to spend time with Jesus. But out of what we're going to look at, I hope you learn that he loves you. And he loves you more than you understand, and I can even try to make you understand. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. God pursues us. It is no accident that Jesus ends up in Samaria. It is no accident 
that he's sitting on the well. It is no accident this lady comes to the well at the same time that Jesus is there. This is no coincidence. This is no happenstance. Jesus shows up at the same time she is coming, and there he is, and he initiates a conversation with her, and he opens dialogue and uh, starts this conversation that we're going to read about, that is, and, it, and it's all God doing that. It's no coincidence he's there, and it's no coincidence in your life that things have happened in your life that put you where you are and, and have worked out the way they have. It's God. And there's things in your life and in my life where God is intersecting us, and sometimes we don't, we're not even aware of it. We've just got blinders on. All we can think about is our to-do list or what we have to get done, and we're rushing through the day, and God's trying to meet us, and he's sitting there, trying to engage us, and uh, we're, we're not even aware of it. We're just, we're just in our own little world. Well, on this day, this woman met Jesus personally, and he opens a dialogue, and it's all Jesus at the right time in her life, at the right moment in her life, where she can receive it and understand it. Number two, God loves us and accepts us. Verse 9 through verse 19, Jesus, this woman, has a conversation that's absolutely astounding. Number one, she's astounded that he would speak to her. Number two, the disciples, when they get back from grocery shopping, they're astounded that this conversation is happening. And the townsfolk, who really know this woman, are astounded that Jesus would talk to her. Everybody is astounded. Verse 9, the woman says, I mean, it's, it's blatant. It's right there. She says, I can't believe that you, a Jew, would even, even take the time to talk to me. Number two, you would ask me for a drink. Number three, you would be willing to drink of a vessel that I have. You being a Jew, and you look at us as we are not worthy of being called a Jew, and yet you would drink from a, a vessel of mine and not feel like you're contaminated? How is that possible? Number one, understand that it was not culturally acceptable in that day and time for a stranger, a man, to talk to a woman. That was not acceptable. Number two, the Jews racially looked at them and said, they are not clean, so we don't talk to them. And number three, spiritually, they looked at them as they were so far lost, they, were, they don't waste your time with them. Verse 16, Jesus asks her about her husband. And she says, uh, it's complicated. It's complicated. I, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, that's right, it's complicated. You've had five husbands and the guy you're with now you're not married to. I know. And she is looking at him, a total stranger saying, how do you know that? How is that possible? You know that about me. That's not posted on Facebook. I've not, I've not said nothing. I've not done that. How do you know that? God knows things about us that we don't know that He knows, but He knows. Matter of fact, there's nothing in your life that God doesn't know about. Everything in your life that you think is secret is no secret to God. He knows it all. And in spite of all of that, He loves you. He loves us anyway. It, in spite of us. Isn't that incredible? The love of God is that, is that enormous, is that broad, that not only does He pursue us, but He loves us in spite of how we are, not what, what, for what we will become or what we could do for Him. He just loves us unconditionally and knowing all our flaws and our weaknesses and our stupidity and he loves us anyway read about a guy that called the librarian head librarian in the middle of the night and uh, she wasn't going to take the call but she took the call and and guy on the other end says what time does the library open in the morning and uh, she is furious now because it's a she assumes it's a crank call and says why are you calling me in, in the middle of the night he said, I want to know what time the library opens. And she is mad. You called me about that? 
We open at 9 o'clock. Why would you be in such a hurry to get into the library? He said, I don't want in. I want out. <laughs> We've all done some stupid stuff. I mean, we could write a book. Don't write a book. We could write a book about our stupid stuff. And we've all, we've all been there, done that. God loves us anyway. In spite of that mess, in spite of that car wreck, in spite of that, He loves you. He loves that, He loved that woman standing right there with all her issues and it didn't change anything. No matter what the townsfolk said about her, what people thought of her, and I mean, she had a past. I mean, this kind of gal that the old women in the church would roll their eyes and click their tongue and say, ooh, she wild. <laughs> and God loved her. And God loves you. And it doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, or who with. He loves you. An old hymn that says the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul just to think that God loves me. What an incredible message this world needs to know that God loves them. Number three, God's love transforms us. There's a conversation here that Bev sang about, a conversation where Jesus is talking to her about water, and uh, she is confused. She is under the impression that she is going to meet a need for him. And the truth is, Jesus is there to meet a need for her. <laughs> and it's, and it's kind of comical. She's confused, but she's trying to figure this out. How in the world is he going to give me water? He don't even have a cup to draw from. How in the world is he going to draw this living water that I've been drinking out of this well all my life? There ain't nothing special about it. It's just plain water. He's talking about living water. Where is he going to get this from? He doesn't have a bucket to draw it from. Uh, number three, if that's the case, how come as old as I am, I'm just now finding out about it? But she says, I think I want it. And she will say, give me this living water so I don't ever have to come back to this well again. I can be over and done with it. And there's some would even say there's a reason why she comes at noon when it's normal cultural, culturally that all the women would come in the evening to draw water. But she comes at noon by herself. You connect the dots. Jesus will turn the conversation away from just plain physical water to spiritual water and he's now he's talking to her about her soul and he's talking about something that God has to give her and it's the love of God that can change her life the love of God that she's been looking for all her life and didn't even know it and all the relationships she's been in chasing that love didn't know that down in her heart really she had never find it with another man she only find it in a relationship with Jesus Christ Verse 25, she says, I've heard, the rumor on the street is, there's coming a Messiah called Christ. I've, I've heard that. Verse 26, Jesus says to her, uh -huh. that's who's talking to you. <laughs> if I can paraphrase it, the gospel according to Mark. <laughs> if I, if I, it's me. She didn't come to that decision immediately. And Jesus didn't strong arm her and force her into that decision. But she got there on her own. And that's how it has to be with all of us. We have to get there on our own. He is the Messiah and I need Him. I need what He, want, what he has to offer. In verse 9, she referred to Him as nothing more than a Jew. In verse 12, she takes a step farther. You're, you're one greater than Jacob, the one who dug the well. Verse 19, she says, uh, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Verse 25, she connects the dots and says, he's the Christ. All of us have to get there some way, somehow in our life where you get to the point where you go from, well, that was, that was uh, who my daddy worshipped or my mama worshipped or grandparents worshipped, but you get to the point and say, that's who I worship." 
is Jesus Christ. And I make him my Savior and my Lord. Verse 39. Look at, I'm jumping ahead. Verse 39, this is what the townsfolk say. She went out and told them all about it. She left her pitcher and went and told the people in the community all about Jesus. Verse 39, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the sayings of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And, and he did, he, he abode there two more days. And many more believed because of his word. In verse 42, they said to the woman, now we believe not because of your sayings, for we have heard him ourselves, and we know that he is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. She came to faith with him right there at the well. And then she went out in the community. She left her, her vessel, went out in the community, and told everybody, and they came. Jesus spent two extra days in Sychar. Many will come to believe because of that woman's testimony. She was transformed, not by a program, but by a person, the person of Jesus Christ. She encountered him, and if you or I or anyone encounters him, you'll, you'll be changed one way or another. If you, if you don't believe, you'll, you'll be changed, but, but if you do believe, you'll really be changed for the better. Some people have a hard time with this. If you've been kicked around in life and, and uh, it seems like everybody else has got the easy path to prosperity and they never have trouble and that's all you've ever known and somebody says God loves you, some people just can't grasp it. If you grew up in a home where you were never told that you were loved or appreciated or maybe you were never hugged and one day somebody says to you, God loves you. Some people just have a hard time with that. If you've been kicked around in relationships and used and abused and someday somebody says, God loves you, sometimes the heart's so cold and hard that it's hard for that light and that love to break through all that wall that's been built to protect yourself. If you're never taken to church or Sunday school and maybe as a child nobody ever prayed over you, somebody says out there in the world, God loves you. Sometimes that can just be hard for people to grasp and get a hold of. But here was a lady that had been through a lot of stuff, a lot of issues, a lot of baggage, and you know what? She's able to get through it all and recognize here is somebody that loves me and cares about me. And I'm going to take my chances with him. <laughs> if you've done that, you understand he loves us all infinitely more than the preacher can ever say. Dr. Criswell, famous, famous pastor, visiting and pastoring in Chicago, the big Baptist church, and he, he got to stay in the house of a, one of the main deacons in that church. And the man's name was James Craft. He was uh, over the superintendent of, of their Sunday school and, and uh, big wig in the church, but he was also big in his business for Craft Foods. <laughs> But he, but he gave his testimony to Dr. Criswell about how, as a young boy, he immediately knew what he wanted to do. I, he knew that he wanted to manufacture and sell cheese, and his life ambition goal was to get fabulously wealthy and rich in that, in that business. And uh, through different enterprises, even as a young boy, Later, he, he will rent a little wagon, and he had a pony called Patty, and he went up and down the streets of Chicago and uh, trying to sell cheese door to door, and that went for a long time, and he was getting more discouraged and more broke with each passing month. He is not making it rich, getting rich. He's not 
getting uh, anywhere in life like he thought he would with all his goals and charts that people have and where I'll be when this age. And it, nothing is going right. And one day he said, I stopped right in the middle of the street with my pony and my wagon. The year was 1907. And he began to talk to his little pony. He said, Patty, I think we got it all wrong. I think we got it all wrong. He, he said, I think I need to give my life to Jesus. And he went home that day and he made a commitment to give his life to Christ. And the rest is history. God blessed his life in, in ways that he could never, ever a dream. Yeah, he made it big in cheese. <laughs> Kraft Foods is, is the biggest food distributor in America. Who doesn't like macaroni and cheese? <laughs> a lot of kids are raised on it. I don't know about how you came to Christ, but I was at the bottom of the barrel looking up. And I had run to the end of my leash and I knew that I knew that I knew there's, there ain't no way out of this. I need Jesus. And I bowed and prayed a, a simple little prayer that a lot of people prayed. And I gave my heart to the Lord and said, Lord, I need you. I'm, I'm a sinner. And please forgive me. There's a hymn and a hymnal God only knows how many people's lives is touched. It says, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And in that moment, I forget the rest, but I know there's a point where it says I come. That's how we all come, just as we are. I'm not trying to be somebody else. I'm not trying to pretend. I'm not trying to be religious and I'm trying to be good. God loves me and accepts, and accepts me just the way I am and just the way you are. But let me tell you something. He loves you too much to leave you like that. He will transform your life. I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads. I don't assume to know nothing. I'm just the preacher. But if you're here and you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, you've never prayed that prayer really, but you would like to, and you would like to invite Jesus to come into your heart like the woman at the well, you join in with me and I'm going to pray a prayer and you follow with me. Make it your prayer. Pray it from your heart right where you are. Say, Dear Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. I give my life to you right here, right now. I want to live for you. I believe you died for me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that, I want you to tell me that today before you get out of here. I want you to get up close to me and say, Preacher, I prayed for you today. I need to know that. You need to tell somebody that. That's, that's special. That's important. But uh, God bless you. Bless you. The Bible says that the angels rejoice in heaven when somebody commits their life to Christ. They rejoice and celebrate in heaven. I'm going to ask this stand. God bless you for coming to church today. Go out and understand you're loved. God loves you and we do too. Go out and life's different when you know that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and we thank you for the promise 
of your love now and always. May we go forth in that. May it give us strength and courage for what we face. Bless each one that's here. Bless those that couldn't be here. May the hand of God be on each one of us. May we live by faith to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here.